Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's University of Maine Cooperative Extension Preserving the Maine Harvest webinar. Thank you for joining us for week 19 of our food preservation webinar series. These webinars deliver current USDA recommendations for preserving food at home, corresponding with what's growing in your garden and what's for sale from local farmers. I'm Kate McCarty, and we will also be joined today by my colleagues Lisa Fishman, Laurie Bowen, and Kathy Savoy in the demo kitchen. The mission of the University of Maine Cooperative Extension is to help Maine people improve their lives through an educational process that uses research-based knowledge focused on issues and needs. Our educational programs include agriculture, horticulture, including the Master Gardener program, 4-H youth development, food safety, nutrition, and of course, food preservation. Today, we will be focusing on dehydrating fruits and vegetables. Dehydration is a great way to create long-lasting, lightweight snacks and meals. We'll overview how, to proce how the process preserves food, how to store dried foods, and then how to use them. We have our webinar set up so that we can't hear or see you, the participants, but we do wanna answer your questions. So please ask them as they come up for you throughout our presentation by using your Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll dedicate time at the end of the presentation to answering your questions. And if we don't get to them live, Lisa will follow up with you by email and provide an answer. So thanks again for joining us and let's get started. So first let's discuss how drying preserves your food. The process of dehydration removes water from your food so that it's not available for spoilage organisms like molds, yeasts, and bacteria to grow in. To make this happen, we apply a low heat to our food, which will cause the water to evaporate. We recommend applying a temperature of 140 degrees Fahrenheit to fruits and vegetables to dehydrate them. It also helps to provide ventilation so the moist air around the food is replaced by drier air so the water can continue to evaporate. Outdoor drying is not recommended in Maine. Successfully dehydrating fruits and vegetables outdoors requires daytime temperatures of above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, nighttime temperatures of above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and humidity of less than 60%. So you can see that we don't have these conditions in Maine. When it gets hot, it's also humid. So outdoor drying is better suited to the Southwest United States where it's hot and dry. Attempting to dehydrate outdoors in improper conditions will result in your food spoiling before it's fully dehydrated. Um, but there are plenty of options for drying indoors. And so Lisa is gonna share with us what kind of equipment you can use for drying at home. Thank you very much, Kate. The first piece of equipment that you're going to need for dehydrating is an electric dehydrator, which will evaporate the moisture in your food, making it safe for long-term storage. Dehydrators come with a set of trays, all of which are made of food grade plastic, and they are open. This allows warm air to move evenly around all of the pieces of food, wicking away the moisture from all sides and allowing for a more rapid process. This particular dehydrator that you're looking at is a round one. It's also made from food grade plastic that comes with five trays, but it can effectively dehydrate up to 20 trays of food. Other dehydrators you may see are square with the heating element in the back. They kind of look like a large toaster oven. Dehydrators can also be made of stainless steel. This dehydrator you're looking at has a digital thermostat and timer which are really nice features. This will keep you from having to get up in the middle of the night to check on your dried foods. It also has a fan and heating element located in the top of the dehydrator. But no matter what shape or material you buy, we recommend a dehydrator with the heating element located in the top or in the back, not the bottom. As foods dry, moisture can drip down into the heating element if it's in the bottom, and that will eventually shorten the lifespan of your appliance. Other accessories for dehydrating that you might use are a screen insert, which can be used for smaller items or lightweight items like herbs, which can fall through the tray. Fruit leather trays also help you to make fruit leathers, 
which is dehydrated puree, and it makes for a very tasty snack. This plastic insert sets right into the dehydrator tray and allows you to pour your pureed fruit into it. A little quick note about something you might want to avoid when shopping for a dehydrator. So this little gem was a Black Friday door buster special, and for 10 bucks, I got what I paid for. It's made of a very hard, brittle type of plastic, number one. And I'm sure that if I had this in my car on a cold winter's day and I banged into the box that it was in, I would probably shatter the trays all, all over the place because the plastic is so brittle. The other thing that you really don't want is the type of on off switch that you see right here in the picture. So, as you heard Kate mention earlier, the ideal temperature for drying fruits and vegetables is 140 degrees. With this particular type of dehydrator, you have no control over the temperature. There's only one option for heat, and that is on. So this is not a real effective way for dehydrating a wide range of foods, each of which may require very specific temperatures for a high quality result. You also, if you really don't want to purchase a dehydrator, you can use your oven with some modifications. Set your oven to the lowest setting, typically around 200, or the warm setting. An oven thermometer will help you read the temperature inside your oven. Remember, foods dry best at 140 degrees. So prop your oven door open a few inches to allow heat and moisture to escape and place a fan on your counter or a stool next to the oven so it blows across the oven's opening to provide ventilation. Now, this setup is not recommended if you have children running around or if you have active pets in your home. It will take about twice as long to dry food using your oven than if you use an electric dehydrator and is also less efficient. It's best for the occasional use for something that doesn't take long to dry, like jerky or herbs. Microwave drying is another recommended way of dehydrating foods, but that's only recommended for herbs, as it does not have proper ventilation to dry other foods successfully. We did cover drying herbs in our week five webinar on preserving herbs, which we've recorded and posted on our website. We'll include that webinar resource in our follow-up email. Now we're going to uh, learn a little bit about dehydrating fruit in a video that Kate has pre-recorded. Hi, I'm Kate McCarty, Food Preservation Program Aide at University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Dehydrating or drying fruit is a great way to create your own snacks at home while controlling the amount of added sugar. Take advantage of local or homegrown fruit and preserve them using an electric dehydrator. Solar dehydrating is not recommended in Maine because of our high humidity levels and low nighttime temperatures. To dehydrate fruit, you'll need an electric dehydrator, a cutting board, a knife, and a peeler. Materials to store dry fruit in need to be airtight and made of plastic or glass. Rinse fruit and peel as needed, then slice into equal size pieces. To dry whole fruits, like berries, dip into boiling water for 15 to 30 seconds or until the skin split. Spread fruit pieces on dehydrator trays, making sure to avoid overlap. Dehydrate at 140 degrees Fahrenheit until dry. Fruit pieces are dry when they are still flexible, but do not stick to themselves when folded in half. This can take anywhere from 12 to 36 hours, depending on the types of fruit you're drying and how thick the pieces are. Dry fruit thoroughly to avoid spoilage. You can also create a low sugar fruit leather by blending fruit like berries with applesauce as a healthy alternative to store-bought fruit snacks. To store your dried fruit, pack it into an airtight plastic or glass container and store in a cool, dark, dry place. To learn more about dehydrating food, visit University of Maine Cooperative Extension's website. some tips about the uh, or to the information shared in the video. 
So first up, you might choose to use a pre-treatment to keep your fruit from darkening. Light-colored fruits like apples, pears, and peaches will darken once cut and exposed to air. A lemon juice or ascorbic acid dip will help prevent this. And then once your fruit is dry, it needs to go through a process called conditioning. This helps to evenly distribute the remaining moisture throughout the pieces of fruit. So you'll let the fruit cool and then pack it loosely in plastic, glass, plastic or glass jars. Seal up the containers and let them sit for a week to 10 days, checking them every few days to look for any moisture inside the jar. If you do see condensation, the fruit needs to be dried some more. And then after a week, you can package your fruit in an airtight container and you can pack it more tightly into the jars than you would for conditioning. Um, you can also use zip top bags to pack your fruit into individual portions. And so this will help your food from absorbing moisture from the air as you repeatedly open the bag to take some fruit out. So now Kathy's in the kitchen and she's gonna walk us through making fruit leather, which is one of our favorite homemade dried snacks. Thanks, Kate, and yes, welcome everyone to the Demo Kitchen. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about one of my family's favorite recipes from the dehydrator, and that is a fruit leather. And before we dive into the details of that very simple uh, recipe, I'd like to show you a little bit more about the dehydrator and some of the um, characteristics of this dehydrator and why we like it so much. Um, so as mentioned before, this type of a dehydrator does have that top mounted fan. So here's the top of the food dehydrator and underneath is where you find the fan element and it does blow the air down onto the food. And the way the trays are set up, it allows for lots of movement of that air across the trays and then down through the trays. So really an effective way to dehydrate food. Um, another element of this dehydrator that increases its efficiency is the fact that it operates on a thousand kilowatts. So it really is, um, you know, a, a superhero sort of dehydrator in that it does dehydrate foods efficiently. Um, we mentioned before that it has a digital display and unlike that dehydrator that Lisa pointed out, this one does give you a range of temperature to select from. And the range actually goes from 90 degrees to 160 degrees, which does cover all of the recommended temperatures for dehydrating different types of foods. And it also gives you the option of increasing those temperatures by just five degrees. So you can go 90, 95, 100, 105, which is really great. Um, and you'll find that you use that feature a lot as you get into dehydrating. It also has a timer that, so you can set it and forget it. And it does operate on 30 minute increments. So it's a really um, great tool in that it has those features available for you. And already mentioned is the fact that it can go from four trays to 20 trays. So you can really get a lot of volume um, dehydrated in one you know, setting. So it's really very effective. Um, another thing that I really wanted to mention about this is that it has really stood the test of time for us and it has certainly experienced a lot of wear and tear. And we have dehydrated everything from fish and onions, which are very strong odors, to things like just regular vegetables and even beef jerky. And I have found that the trays are very easy to clean in between use, and you can um, clean them in your dishwasher on the top rack. And the other thing is, is we've never had a transfer of odors between one food that we're dehydrating to another. So this is you know, a really good product and we wanted to share some of those special features with you and let you know why we like it. So let's dive into the fruit leather uh, recipe that I'm gonna demonstrate today. You may also know fruit leather and its other name, which are fruit roll-ups, fruit rolls, different things like that. Um, these are very tasty and chewy treats and um, my frugal side likes them a lot because it allows me to, when I make a homemade jelly, um, turn that leftover 
um, puree that you have in the jelly bag, um, you can simply, instead of composting that, you can turn that into a fruit leather. So you puree all of that, let's say strawberry um, leftover after you've dripped out the juice from your strawberries, you can puree that and turn that into a fruit leather. So you're operating on a zero waste kitchen, which is a really nice thing to be able to do. Um, and I just wanna emphasize that these, uh, you know, fruit leather is naturally sweet. And why is that? Um, as we've mentioned in our science of dehydrating foods, you know, you're removing the water content of the food. And in removing the water um, concentration, you are also intensifying or concentrating the natural sugars that are present in fruit. They're called fructose. And as the water leaves, those um, flavors become more concentrated. So you have that, um, sweeter taste from the naturally occurring fruit. And that's what you find in fruit leathers. So let's talk a little bit about how we go about making fruit leather. And um, you simply need to puree fruit. And you can start with fresh fruit, frozen fruit, canned fruit. Um, sky's the limit on whatever type you choose to use. As mentioned previously, if you are using a light colored fruit, you're gonna wanna have something like a lemon juice or um, an ascorbic acid, this is commercial fruit fresh, to keep it from darkening. I'm making a wild Maine blueberry fruit leather today, so there's no concern around that getting dark or oxidizing. Um, so uh, typically you're going to wanna have about two cups of the fruit puree per sheet um, for your fruit leather. Let's take a quick second to look at the fruit leather tray. So we showed you this in a previous slide, but we want you to see it um, in person. And you can see that it has a nice little rim on the edge that is in the center and on the outside as well. And that's gonna help to contain the fruit leather so you can pile up the recommended amount of the puree. And you wanna have an eighth of an inch in your um, fruit leather tray. Um, so another thing you may want to do for your tray prior to putting the puree on it is to use a cooking oil spray to get on the tray. And this will help when you're going to remove the fruit leather um, after it's been dehydrated. So there is your uh, fruit leather tray, which oftentimes is an add-on when you're buying a dehydrator. So make sure you read what's coming in your box. And if you do plan to make fruit leather, know that you may need to add that on as an extra um, with this product. So uh, we've got our pureed fruit here. And I love to, as I've mentioned already, um, add applesauce to my fruit, fruit puree. And so I've just buzzed up a bunch of frozen wild main blueberries in my food processor. Um, I'm going to remove the little blade in here as well. And um, so I've got the frozen wild main blueberries. And then I love to add applesauce as well. For me, applesauce, um, I think, really improves the texture of a fruit leather, ultimately. And it will help to create a product that is more pliable and um, is a smoother product in the end. Adding applesauce does not take over the flavor of the blueberries, but it helps to extend um, how much volume we're going to get of our wild main um, fruit leather. So it's a good thing all around. And again, it really does improve the quality. So about two cups of fruit puree per tray. So I've got this pureed and all you do is um, drizzle it around the tray, and then you're going to, I've got a nice spatula here that I will use to spread it out. And that's an important part of making fruit leather is to get this puree evenly dispersed on the tray um, so that when it dries, you're having a consistently dried product and you don't have it um, still kind of wet in one area and over dried and cracking 
in another area. So all that I'm doing is um, spreading it out on that lovely fruit leather tray. And once I get it to a point where I feel like it seems pretty, pretty smooth, pretty even, I'll go ahead and uh, give it an additional sort of tamping down, tapping down to allow it to spread itself out and get more smooth on the tray. So that's all I do, tap it down. Um, so I want to make sure that I've covered all my points and that is that um, if you did, if you did have a product that you needed to have an anti-darkening added to, it would be just two teaspoons of lemon juice or the eighth of a teaspoon of ascorbic acid and that's per the two cups of fruit puree that I've been talking about as far as the volume goes. Um, so we would then put it in our dehydrator and I have found pretty much across the board, every time I go to make a fruit leather, it's 140 degrees for about 10 hours. Um, so last night, that's what I did. I set it at 140 for 10 hours and woke up and it was pretty much perfect. So if I did need to set it for a little bit longer, I could. And again, you can do the 30 minute increments with this food dehydrator. Um, so this one is ready to head into the dehydrator. But I want to um, take a little Hollywood step here and show you um, last night's um, fruit leather. So this is the product that was created. And you can see we have that desired shiny, and I think you can see the shine here in our lights, um, the shiny, and it's, you want it to be dry, yet somewhat pliable, leathery. And then you can simply um, take the steps that you need to remove this product from the tray. And you can go ahead and um, do a little cracking, if you will, of the tray to release those edges. So um, you can tell I've pulled this one up already, but it does come up as easy as that. If you do have some spots that stick, which I think you can see, I do have one right there. You just wanna carefully use your hands or the back side of a spoon to get up underneath that and have it release from the tray. Um, so can't say enough about how much we love the, the fruit leather. And then once you've got it off your tray, um, you're going to go ahead and um, you can cut it up. You can use a knife to cut it up. You can use scissors to cut it up. And you're going to, um, so here's what's left of my uh, fruit leather and I use some scissors and I just cut it up and then stack it up. You could roll it up. You might want to use some saran wrap or wax paper in between each of these pieces and then store it in. Um, if you're going to be storing it for long term, you want to store it in the freezer. So I've got a freezer grade bag here that's marked wild Maine blueberry fruit leather with the date September of 2020. Um, but if you were going to use it more quickly, which was always the case in my house, um, you can store it for one month at room temperature. Honestly, I don't think it ever lasted that long because it was consumed prior to one month being up. Uh, but that's how we would go ahead and store it. Again, it's one year in the freezer or um, within one month at room temperature. And so that's kind of the basics of how to make your own fruit leather. I do want to emphasize that if you are creative, you can um, add some different flavors or garnishes. You can combine different types of fruits. You could even look to make a savory um, leather. Um, so any, any way you look at it, the sky's the limit. And these are certainly fun things to have available in your kitchen. So with that, I'm going to take it back to Lisa and see uh, what else we're going to learn about dehydrating vegetables. Lisa? Thank you, Kathy. So many great tips going on over there in the demo kitchen. What we're going to do now before we do any more learning is we're going to take a poll and we would like to know from you which of these methods is not recommended for drying foods in Maine. Is it oven drying, electric dehydrator drying, outdoor drying, or microwave drying. And we'll give folks a few seconds 
we're about 75% done. Five, four, three, two, one. Wonderful. We're going to end that poll. And absolutely, we do not want to do any outdoor dehydrating here in Maine because we certainly don't have that low humidity and hot temperatures on a reliant, a reliable basis. Um, there were a couple comments about using the microwave, and that is correct. We, you can use the microwave for limited circumstances. So I'm going to give credit to that answer as well. Um, it's not a uh, open use type of um, tool that you want to be using here in Maine or under in any state for dehydrating purposes. It's limited to pretty much herbs. Excellent, excellent. So we are now going to watch another little video that Kate made that will teach us about drying vegetables. Hi, I'm Kate McCarty, University of Maine Cooperative Extension Food Preservation Program Aid. Dehydrating or drying vegetables is a great way to create lightweight snacks and meals for outdoor activities. Preserve your local or homegrown vegetables using an electric dehydrator. Solar dehydrating or outdoor drying is not recommended in Maine because of our high humidity levels and low nighttime temperatures. The supplies that you'll need are an electric dehydrator, a cutting board, knife, stock pot, peeler, blanching basket, colander, paper towels, dish towels. Materials to store dried foods in need to be airtight and made of plastic or glass. With clean hands, clean equipment, and a clean work surface, you're ready to start. To begin, rinse and prepare vegetables as needed. Peel, shred, or chop into equal sized pieces. To improve the quality of your dried product, blanch or dip into boiling water for a specific amount of time before dehydrating. Drain vegetables well in a colander and dry using clean kitchen towels or paper towels. See our website for specific blanching time. Spread vegetable pieces out on, a, on dehydrator trays making sure to avoid overlap. Dehydrate at 140 degrees Fahrenheit until dry. Vegetables are dry when they are brittle, crisp, and retain 10% moisture. Drying can take anywhere between three and 18 hours depending on the vegetable you're drying and how thick the pieces are. Dry vegetables thoroughly to avoid spoilage. To store, pack vegetables into airtight plastic or glass containers and keep in a cool, dark, dry place. Dried vegetables need to be rehydrated before use. Rehydrate by soaking in water for several hours. For more information on dehydrating food, visit University of Maine Cooperative Extension's website. Awesome. So we did want to mention again that dehydrated foods or dried foods are really great for backpacking or camping. They don't spoil, you don't need to find refrigeration for them. They're very lightweight and they're shelf stable. Dehydrating is a great alternative for canning if you can't find canning supplies. And aren't we all experiencing just a little bit of that this year? They're very space efficient and they shrink in size significantly during the dehyd dehydrating process. So they take up a lot less room. Dried vegetables, as Kate mentioned, do need to be rehydrated, so it's best to use them in a cooked application like soups or stews or casseroles. You want to rehydrate your dried vegetables in water, either hot water or cold water will do, and add them directly to your dish as long as it has a lot of liquid in it, like a soup. You can also soak them in broth or vegetable juice to add flavor. They'll rehydrate with about, in about one to two hours of soak time. You can also grind dried vegetables up into a powder and use it to boost the flavor of your cooking and baking. Kathy's going to show us how to, oops, and there's a slide of dried vegetable powders right there. Um, this was a powder that I had made using two full bunches of celery that I dehydrated and then popped into a little spice grinder or a coffee grinder. And you can see the dish on the right, it's just a, a small little monkey dish and it filled it just about up. And that was two full stalks of celery. Very efficient on the space storage. Now Kathy is gonna show us how to make uh, a wonderful recipe using dehydrated tomatoes that her brother-in-law gifts to her every year. 
Thanks, Lisa. And this is a super quick dip recipe, which is great because I can see our Q&A box is filled with your questions that we want to make sure and get to. Um, so what I have are some uh, dried tomatoes, so dehydrated tomatoes, and these are all sorts of different types of tomatoes. And, you know, what better than a, a dip as we move into football season to figure out how to get these great dehydrated foods back into something that we can enjoy. Um, so I have your traditional dip base, which is um, mayonnaise, sour cream, cream cheese, and you can really get super creative, flavor it up however you wish. And so I have chopped these dehydrated tomatoes ahead of time. I could have soaked them in oil if I wanted to. I could have soaked them in water. Um, I really prefer to just chop them up and enjoy that nice little texture that they give um, in the, um, the dip. And then we also have some flavors to add. And again, here's where you let your creativity flow. Uh, we've got some garlic powder, we've got some white pepper, and we've got some salt that we're gonna mix in here. And then uh, to add additional flavor, and also a way to use up some of your dried spices, we've got just a teaspoon of an, uh, an Italian seasoning mix. So that's gonna bring in all those rosemary, oregano, basil sorts of flavors um, that really go so well with a sun-dried tomato. So mixing this up, we've got uh, everything incorporated. And when you're working with dehydrated foods, it's nice to give them some time to set so that the flavors can meld together. Remember they're dry, they want to have some time to be able to incorporate into um, the liquid. So here we've got our little uh, dip tray that we might take and we might share with our family at the next football game. So uh, hopefully you followed along quickly with that recipe and then have a nice little dehydrated tomato to use as a garnish. So simple enough, great way to use your dehydrated products once you've got them in your kitchen. So now to Lisa to answer that box full of questions. Lisa? I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in and uh, supply some questions here. Our first one is from Kathleen, and this goes back to the testing for doneness with fruits. Um, Kate had covered that in the video, but Kathleen's question is, the pieces can be bent but won't stick to itself if it is done. And she's wondering, is that appropriate for all fruits? Uh, for example, she dehydrated watermelon a couple of months ago, and it stayed sticky seemingly forever. So she wanted to double check on that. Yes, so that is the advice for all fruits. So yeah, if your um, fruit is still sticky, even after an exceedingly long period of time in the dehydrator, it's, it just means that it still needs more time. Um, as you can imagine, watermelon is gonna take a while to dehydrate. Um, I did look up the recommendation for how long. Um, it says dry until leathery and pliable with no pockets of moisture. So it doesn't actually give a guidance for how long because um, that could vary depending on your, your environmental condition. So if it's sticky, you got to keep going. Um, the point is to avoid it becoming too brittle unless that's how you want it. So if you want crunchy fruit snacks, you can dry them longer so they're nice and crunchy. But if they still retain that tackiness, you, do will, uh, you will run the risk of food spoilage as they sit in storage. Okay. Thanks, Kate. Um, we also have a question from Debbie. And the question is, do you have to preheat the dehydrator? Yes, yeah, so preheating your dehydrator is a great um, best practice so that you are putting your food into that 140 degrees Fahrenheit environment um, immediately rather than having um, a period in which it's coming to temperature um, if you put the dryer on and hit start. So yeah, preheating your dehydrator is great best practice during drying. Um, you can just start the dryer while you're still preparing your trays so that when you put the food in there, it's ready to go. Um, that said, I have run the dehydrator without preheating it um, and, and ended up with a fine product, but this will just help control the temperature and cut down your risk of spoilage. Okay, thanks. So our next question is from Jen, and she says, I know that with canning, you need an exact amount of acid. Is there fruit and vegetables that can't be dehydrated? Um, 
Not from an acidic perspective. So you can dehydrate um, vegetables, which are low acid. Most fruits tend to be acidic. Um, but the, the way that dehydrating preserves your food in this case is to remove the moisture so that those spoilage organisms can't grow in it. Um, then there are things that aren't recommended to be dry, but that's from a quality perspective um, that you just might not end up with a very usable final product. Now, Sylvia would like to know, in order to keep costs down, is it necessary to use the lemon juice or ascorbic acid if you don't mind the color change? So those anti-darkening treatments like the lemon juice, ascorbic acid, are to control the oxidation, which is, um, affects the color of the product. So that is a quality issue. Um, that said, in some of the, the recommendations, it is referenced that they can have antibacterial properties as well. So they could play a safety role. Again, I have done um, fruit without using the pretreatment and it turned out fine. So that would be an additional safety method, um, but for the most part, I wanna say it's for quality. So you can skip it. Okay. I've skipped it and it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question from Joni. Um, can you use the fruit and vinegar, soft fruit um, left over from a shrub prep and add sugar or sweetener to that? Certainly, yeah. So um, she's asking about shrubs, the um, vinegar fruit sugar mixture that we talked about in our um, drinks from the garden um, webinar back in June. And so when you finish your sh making your shrub product, um, you are left with this great fruit mixture that you could certainly use and um, as a dehydration. You could spread it out like fruit leather and dry it. You could certainly mix it with applesauce to make fruit leather. I want to say that Kathy has done that before. Um, and then you could also just powder it up and use it for um, all kinds of fruit. Kathy's going to weigh in. <laughs> I will say, yeah, it's, it's a great, really tangy, fun um, taste to enjoy. Uh, but I will also add dehydrated pickles are a real fan favorite, especially with kids. So consider that. Mm -hmm. I remember that someone in our master food preserver class made those. I do remember that. It's like pickle, pickle jerky. It was very interesting. <laughs> now I'm super interested too. I've got to check that out. Um, Sarah would like to know, could you use pears in place of the apples when making the fruit leather? Yeah, most definitely. You can use any kind of fruit sauce that you might have on hand, um, or if you just wanted to whip up some pear sauce. Most definitely. So the role that that plays, again, it's kind of just a neutral base to help stretch. Maybe if you um, grown your own fruit or bought fruit, you know, it's a little more precious than, than apples, which are widely available. And so it also is a pretty neutral flavor. And so it really helps you emphasize the, the flavors of the berries that you add in. Um, and then it has that natural pectin, which will give you a nice um, smooth, pliable fruit leather rather than having it crack into little pieces like the surface of a desert if you don't have any um, pec naturally occurring pectin in it. Okay. Yeah, pear would be great. All right. So Andrea um, has a question and she was always told to dry fruits and veggies at 125 degrees to prevent the outsides from drying before the insides. And of course, we're suggesting the 140. She would like to know, can you speak to the difference in these recommendations? And also she was told to dry um, to crisp to help it have a long shelf life and only store it in glass for long-term storage. Um, so everything that I have seen from USDA recommends 140 degrees Fahrenheit, but you're right in that, the, that it is trying to achieve that um, kind of sweet spot between if the temperature is too um, high, it will just cook your food and um, Andrea is referencing something where if, the, if you apply too much heat to your food, uh, the exterior of it can harden and actually prevent moisture from escaping from inside the fruit um, and your product will never fully dehydrate. It'll just have this baked hard outer shell and then um, we'll just start to spoil on the inside. Um, and so that is called case hardening um, and too high of a temperature can create those conditions. I actually had it happen with some cherry tomatoes. I cu did cut them in half um, but just the way that I cut them, like the middle of the tomato had created kind of a seal. And you could just see the tomato was shrinking 
slightly, but there was still a lot of moisture inside that was never going to be able to evaporate. So um, it is recommended to um, cut your fruit up or if you're going to dry it whole um, to do what's called checking, which was that step where I was um, dunking whole fruits, but like berries, briefly in boiling water to split the skins to allow the moisture from inside to escape. Um, okay, so that was a long, what were the other questions? <laughs> I, I believe that um, that that takes care of the, the entire question. Um, it was pretty long. Um, so I am going to move on to um, Linda's question. I'm trying to balance things out between the fruits and the vegetables. She would like to know um, about storing dehydrated veggies in the freezer. Um, and also part two is, is it safe to use dried chilies to make chili oil? So you can certainly store your dried foods in the freezer to extend their shelf life. Um, the appeal, of course, of dried food is that it does not need an additional method of food preservation to store. Um, so you can keep them for shorter periods of time at uh, room temperature, but if you really want to go the long haul, you could package them up for the freezer as well. And then, yeah, you can use um, dried chilies to infuse your oils. However, there are significant safety concerns around putting um, produce, like specifically fresh produce, into oil. And so you reminded me that we have a great fact sheet on infusing herbs, um, or excuse me, infusing oils with um, home safe homemade and flavored and infused oils. So I'm gonna send that along um, in the resources for today. So it details the best practices for infusing oils. Um, and that does include using dried chilies versus fresh chilies or garlic or something. So dried products are okay. You just have to be um, careful about how you store them and their shelf life. So I'll send that publication along and just being sure that you um, follow the recommendations because the concern actually is botulism. So um, <laughs> you have to be concerned about putting fresh ingredients into oil and creating an environment in which botulism can survive at room temperature or can grow, so. Okay, thank you, Kate. It looks like we are just about out of time for questions. I uh, just wanna assure everyone that you will receive an answer um, when Lisa does follow up. Thank you, Lori. We do wanna um, share this week's recommended resources. You'll get all of these resources that are listed here included in a follow-up email. We'll also share with you the Maine Farm Products Directory to help you find local produce and shop directly at farms. New farms are still being added to the directory. Be sure to visit the farm's website or call ahead first so you can learn about how their policies may have changed due to COVID-19. And don't forget about our Preserving Coach program. This is an opportunity for Maine residents to be paired with a trained Master Food Preserver volunteer for preserving advice throughout the entire growing season. We still have volunteers available, available to coach you. Maine residents interested in a Preserving Coach can contact Kate McCarty. Her email is located at the bottom of that slide that you're viewing. Next week, we'll be back on the first Tuesday of October, believe it or not, at 2 p.m. to discuss root cellaring. Other topics we'll be talking about in October include pressure canning meat, safely storing grains and other bulk goods, and preserving cranberries. Look for an email later today with information on how to register and all the resources from today's session. We'll also share a link to an evaluation and certificate of completion. Complete our evaluation and provide your US mailing address and we'll send you a free Headspace tool, which is used in canning. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and we hope you have a terrific afternoon. Bye. See you next Thank week. Thank you.